Hello everyone, this is Priestley and today I am going to be showing you how to build a competitive deck in Fable Fortune using only basic cards and commons. Now if you've played Hearthstone or Gwent or the Elder Scrolls Legends or pretty much any other collectible card game, then you're probably going to be asking yourself, sure, I want to build a competitive deck but I need lots of legendaries and fabled cards maybe and at least some rares to be able to do so, right? Uh, well, in Fable Fortune, believe it or not, you actually don't. It is very possible to build a competitive deck at the moment using only the lowest rarity of cards. Um, and I'm going to be showing you how to do that. Um, of course, later on you will want to maybe include a few higher rarity cards in particular decks, but what I'm going to be showing you today is how to build a deck core of commons and basic cards that you can use um, at the moment at pretty much any stage of uh, competition. Uh, and that will remain very effective no matter who your opponent is, basically. Um, this I will also start with neutral cards. I'll show off the neutral cards that I tend to use when I build a new deck and show you how you can use those as a core for pretty much any hero class um, and that you can then support those neutral cards with a couple of class cards to make a competitive deck for pretty much any class. Um, if you are a new player, um, I'm create a new deck here, so this will give you the option of which hero to choose for your deck. If you are a new player, I would at the moment recommend you begin with either Prophet, Shapeshifter or Gravedigger. Um, those are, in my opinion at least, the strongest heroes in competitive PvP at the moment. Um, the Knight and the Alchemist are also playable. Um, the Knight especially can be very good for a new player, particularly if you like tempo or aggro decks. Um, the Merchant I would really hold off on at the moment. Not only does the Merchant favor either a combo or a controlling playstyle, but I also genuinely believe it's actually the worst and arguably the most difficult to use hero at the moment, and it really needs some rebalancing to make it uh, more powerful. So I will not be discussing the Merchant today. Um, let me just start with a uh, Prophet Core, just to show you what I mean. Um, but I'm going to be talking mostly about neutral cards first, so I could really pick any hero here. Let's just call this Competitive Deck for Beginners. Alright, now the first thing we're going to be looking at is the basic cards. These are cards which any player with a new account starts out with. And some of them are actually very good at any stage of the game. So, let's see, we're going to filter by rarity and select basic. Uh, and then we're going to look at, for starters, the neutral cards only. The neutral cards you can recognize because they have this, uh, this symbol around their gold cost. Uh, class specific cards have a different symbol. Um, and there are a number of neutral cards which really are very strong and remain useful at any stage of the game at the moment. Um, and that'll probably remain true until they um, either make drastic balance changes, which I don't expect, uh, at least not for the neutral cards, or until they release more cards, obviously. Um, so let's see, the first card which we are going to be including is Bandit Crossbowman, the 2 1 for 2 gold with big entrance deal one damage to an enemy. Now this may seem insignificant, but doing small amounts of ping damage like this is really crucial in maintaining board control. Let's say you are able to bring a creature on the opponent's board down to one health and you need one damage to ping it off um, and actually kill it, which makes a big difference in terms of uh, board control, then this card will help you to do it and it's uh, very solid, even outside of a dedicated bandit deck. So that's the first card we'll include. Um, another really solid 2-drop is Bowerstone Bar. Um, again, everyone 
as this card in their collection when they start out. Um, this kind of does the opposite of Bended Crossbowman. Instead of dealing one damage, it buffs a friendly unit for um, plus one plus one, which is also, again, very useful for allowing you to trade effectively with the opponent's minions. Um, let's see, here are some class-specific cards which we are not going to discuss now, such as Apostle and Eradicate. Okay, now very important. Um, if you've played Hearthstone before, then forget everything that you think you know about deck building from Hearthstone. Because unlike in Hearthstone, in Fable Fortune you start the game with 3 gold, which means you have to adjust your deck building in fairly significant ways. So. Three gold cards are actually cards which you can play on turn one, and often they will make up the most efficient turn one plays. Um, particularly the three gold units with high stats are really solid units to play out on the first turn. Um, so units like Bandit Swordsman here, um, as you can see, seven stats for three gold. This is the most efficient um, amount of stats you can get for this gold cost. Um, so we always want to include these, especially if you're a new player, because this is just a really solid first turn play uh, in any scenario. Um, similarly, the Stinger here, very similar to the Bandit Swordsman, but with a slightly different dis distribution of stats being 3-4 instead. Uh, these can go pretty much into any deck. And if you get them in your opening hand, then great. You have a great solid first turn play to start off the game with and begin dictating the tempo. So these two cards are actually really important for just about any deck that you want to build at any stage of the game. Uh, another useful basic card is Tattooist, which is slightly worse in stats, but it has a useful entrance effect when it comes into play, in that you can use it to buff up the strength of adjacent units. Um, this is not as ideal on the first turn, but can still be playable as a 3 3 for 3 even without any creatures to buff it. Um, but its big entrance effect can really be very useful later on in the game to help you to trade more effectively against um, the opponent's units and maintain board control or advance the tempo. So we are going to be including those as well. Now, as you can see, we already have six three-cost units, which should give us a pretty good chance of having a strong playable card on turn one. Um, that will help us immediately uh, set the tone of the game and dictate the tempo. Uh, now we move on to the four cost. Uh, Warrior Hop is very solid in this slot. Um, I generally prefer Warrior Hop over the stack beetle. Uh, four power and five health is a little bit more solid than five power. Four health in general allows you to trade a little bit more effectively against things like uh, Stinger or especially the Bandit Swordsman, for example, which can trade with a stack beetle but not with a hop. So I'll put two of these in. Um, then we are going to gradually curve up with our basic cards. Um, Bowerstone Sheriff is a really strong, solid card with good stats, 3-7, and it also has a safeguard bonus. That means that if you put this into guard, it gains plus one strength, which is really solid. Um, this bonus stacks, so if the Sheriff survives for multiple turns, uh, you can really bring its strength up to a high level. Um, also, don't forget that on your own turn, you can put the Bowerstone Sheriff in guard to buff its strength and then attack with it as well. Um, so you can actually kill a 4 health minion with the Sheriff if it's in play on your turn. Um, many beginning players are not aware of that, but putting a creature into guard doesn't mean that it loses its ability to attack. Uh, let's see, that's for five. We don't need that many five cost minions right now. Um, we are going to just generally curve up. Lord of Bower Lake is a really, really strong basic six cost unit. Um, it's a six five with morality. Morality means that for its effect to trigger, uh, you need to have completed one quest already. Uh, if you don't know what quests are, then uh, check out my other tutorial on the gameplay basics of Fable Fortune. Um, but basically it means that this unit is going to change um, form. It has a good and an evil form depending on which quest you've completed. Um, or depending on whether you chose good or evil upon completing your quest. Um, in this particular case, um, the good version will stay 6-5, but it will give all adjacent units 
um, plus one plus one when it is summoned. Um, the evil version doesn't give any buffs to other creatures, but it comes into play as an 8-7 instead, so it's just a bigger body. Um, either way, it's a really, really solid card that I would definitely recommend any new player to put in their deck. Um, Alright. These higher cost creatures we are not going to bother with at the moment, although Wardock can be a really solid inclusion as well, especially in a deck like Prophet, which we're building, which has a defensive hero power with which you can heal the Wardock. Um, but for the moment, I'm going to leave it at this. Um, as you can see, we already have 16 neutral basic cards now, which are really viable competitively. So that's already more than half our deck, which we've filled up now with just good, strong, solid cards that will help you set and dictate the tempo of the game and hopefully maintain board control. Um, now we're going to supplement these with a few commons. Uh, a few common neutral cards to be precise. Um, commons are the lowest rarity level after basic, of course. Um, you won't generally get these cards to start out with, but they're really, really easy to obtain. Um, commons only cost 40 ink a piece to craft and beating the training mode on hard difficulty, which with the deck we're building, you will easily be able to do. Um, Beating the training mode on hard difficulty actually awards you with exactly 40 ink. So if you do that once, then you can craft a common. And you can basically do that as many times as you like at this stage to get all the commons you need. I definitely recommend playing the training mode a few times anyway to get used to the mechanics of the game and to get used to how the deck plays in general. Um, and by doing so, you can also improve your deck by crafting more commons. And some of the commons in this game are really, really strong. Um, so I definitely recommend you do that. Um, so let's see what we have here. Um, here is another 4-3-4-3. Four, three, four, three. Normally, uh, normally the Callus Master has a special ability that when it comes into play you have to return one of your units to your hand. At the moment because of a bug with it that ability is disabled. Um, it's a really strong ability though so I definitely suggest you put this card back in your deck uh, when it gets changed so that it gets its ability back. As it is, of course, it's also perfectly playable as just a 4-3-4-3. Four, three, four, three. Um, so this is definitely something you could consider adding to your deck if you want, but maybe not the highest priority, given its lack of ability. Um, what is high priority is this card, Iron Assassin. This is a common neutral card, 4-4-4-4, four, 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 uh, with pretty much the same ability as the Bandit Crossbowman. It allows you to do one damage to any enemy unit or to the opponent directly. Um, and it's really just great for, again, maintaining board control, allowing you to finish off low health units, making sure you keep up the tempo of the game. Um, just in general, a very strong card, so I'm going to add two of those. Um, say, for example, that you play a Stinger on turn one. Your opponent also plays a Stinger on turn one. Um, the Hired Assassin allows you to just, on the second turn, tray attack the opponent's Stinger with your Stinger, leaving it at one health. And then you can just play Hired Assassin, ping, one damage uh, to finish it off. And that leaves you with a 3-1 and a 4-4 in play and your opponent with an empty board. So that just in generally already shows you just how strong a potential opening you can get with this. You can really begin dictating the tempo from very early on in the game with a card like this. So that's why we're putting it in here. Uh, similarly, the... Where is it? The Wraith Marsh Slicer, another common. Uh, slightly weaker in terms of stats than the Hired Assassin, being only a 4-2. But this, when it comes into play, allows you to, two, to do 2 damage to an undamaged enemy unit. Um, which again is very, very strong. It allows you to kill a number of units outright and or set them up to be more easily dispatched by your other units um, further on down the turn. So this is definitely unit that we're going to put into our deck as well. Um, just very strong at all stages of the game, basically. And that already gives us 20 cards in our deck. Um, now there are a number of other common cards, neutral common cards, which are very good, but you don't necessarily want to include them into any deck. Particularly if you enjoy playing a more controlling type of deck, maybe a sort of slower um, pace of playing, then this card, 
Ice Cellar is extremely strong. Um, it has a very strong 4-6 body for 5 ghoul. And its last laugh ability allows you to heal yourself for 5. Um, the opponent also heals for 5, but if you're playing a slower controlling deck, then that doesn't really matter too much to you. You just want to survive the early turns of the game as best as you can, and this card will greatly help you in doing that. So if you enjoy a more controlling deck, then I would definitely suggest you craft and add this card to your deck. Uh, similarly, Abbot of Avo can be incredibly useful. A um, little bit more expensive, 3 8 in stats, which is okay. But more importantly, the safeguard ability allows you to heal your hero for 3 when you put it into guard, which is also very helpful um, for keeping yourself alive um, into the later turns of the game, especially against aggressive decks. Um, then lastly, we have Royal Officer, which works extremely well with a hero like Gravedigger in particular, which can summon small units with her hero power, or also to a degree with Marshall the Knight, uh, who has a similar effect. This gives all your other units plus one strength, which obviously allows them to trade better into the enemy um, units and also helps you to maintain board control. So this is also definitely something that you could consider crafting. Um, if you prefer a more swarming type of play with uh, more small units. Um, Alright, so now that we have a good neutral core, 20 out of 30 cards, um, lots of cards in here that are just very strong in general, we're going to supplement this with a few class cards. I'll take a look at each of the classes in turn. Uh, since we started with a profit deck, that's the first class that I'm going to look at, so let's see what we have here. Um, we're going to browse, back to browse cards, select profit. Um, okay, the first thing that you want to definitely include in your deck is this spell, Eradicate, which is very, very strong. It allows you to destroy an enemy unit with more strength than health, um, which is incredibly helpful as profit and just in general. Um, this is a level reward. It won't show up immediately for uh, new players with new accounts. I think it requires you to level profit up to level five, which really doesn't take long at all, to be honest. Um, but when you do, you get this card for free. So I'm definitely going to add this to a profit deck. Um, other cards which are very helpful is Smite the Cynic. Again, this is just a good basic removal spell that is also a cantrip. It allows you to uh, draw another card after you use it, very solid. So we're going to add those. Um, this one is available from the very start of the game, as is Apostle, which is a very strong 2-drop unit. Uh, it basically comes into play as a 3-4 or 2, which is super efficient in terms of stats. Uh, Zeal means that its ability triggers uh, when it is at full health. When it becomes damaged, then it loses this ability. So after this takes any damage, it'll be 1-4 uh, instead, or however many health it has left. But it comes into play as a 3-4 initially, which is really powerful. And we're going to add that as well. And then we still have a number of options here to choose from. Leeching Swarm is great if you're a starting player in that it's great AoE removal later on. Allows you to clear most, if not all, your opponent's board. And it also heals you, which is again great in more controlling type decks. So let's just add two of those for now. Uh, and then for the last two cards to round out the deck with. You can use something like Minion, uh, which is definitely a solid 4-cost Minion, or Protect the Profit, which is a bit more tricky to use and requires you to already have a number of Minions in play, but which has a really strong effect uh, when you do get to use it with 3 Minions in play. Um, I'm just going to add Protect the Profit for now, because I think we already have enough units in this deck. And then... As with any deck, we round it out with a trophy card. Um, this is... All of these are viable to a degree and in different decks. So you basically just need to choose which one of these is best, given the situation. Um, trophy cards you only get if you go second in the game. If you go second in the game, then you get one of these cards added to your opening hand, and you can choose which one it is. It's kind of like the coin in Hearthstone, except you have a choice of what kind of effect you want here, rather than just having a fixed coin card. Uh, for the Prophet, I generally like the Tofu Trader, because Prophet is generally a little bit more defensive, uh, good control, skills well into the late game, and this will keep us healthy early on. 
And it also counts as a small unit to play towards any quests we might have. So I'm going to add that here. And then we can save this. Now, I'm also going to show you um, some of the other class cards for the other classes, which are good to use early on in the game, because we've made a profit deck now, of course, but what if you want to make a shapeshifter deck, or a gravedigger deck, or a knight deck? Well, there are definitely plenty of good class cards to use for those as well. Um, so let's just have a look through those. Um, I'll just filter cards with basic again, that's fine. And then let's have a look at the cards for the other classes. Um, for example, the shapeshifter. Uh, which I think is one of the most powerful classes in the game at the moment. Um, class cards you can include here, which are very good, are Blooded Belverine. This goes well into any shapeshifter deck. It basically just makes your hero power stronger. Um, normally your hero power does one damage, and this allows it to do an additional damage when it's in play. Very useful. Uh, Ambush, also a very strong card, um, a spell that deals 2 damage, but if you've already used your hero power earlier on in the turn, you can do 4 damage instead. That's what Feral means, after you rend an enemy in the turn, then the Feral uh, effect will trigger. Uh, there are a number of other spell cards that also, or unit cards even, that can also rend an enemy if you don't want to use your hero power. For example, Stunning Slash here. It says rend an enemy use it, unit for one damage and stun it. And the fact that it says rend means that it also works with cards like Blood of Belverine, and it also triggers the feral effect of cards like Ambush. So that makes these very strong. So I would definitely include Stunning Slash, Ambush, Blood of Belverine, just two of each. Um, like we need 10 more cards to add from the class specific effects to round out our basic deck in addition to the 20 neutral cards which I'm already using and these three are very solid. Search of Fangs is an absolute must include in any shapeshifter effect. It's one of the strongest AoE removal effects in the game at the moment, uh, possibly a little bit overpowered. Um, so definitely include that, that's 8 cards and then you can round out the deck with um, I guess either one of these two cards would probably be the best option or if you want to try and play a more burst Heavy deck, you could even include this one. All of these are playable to a degree. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the squirrel myself, even though it is adorable and I know many players do like to use it. Um, so I would probably go with Crack Prey here just to give you an additional draw later on in the game. You never really want to play this on turn one because it sets you up for a very passive early game in which you'll be defending and have the tempo dictated to you by the opponent the majority of the cases but later on in the game this can be incredibly useful to refill your hand with um grave digger also a ton of useful class cards um there's a number of absolute must include cards in here if you're a new player necro blast incredibly powerful eulogy is a class mechanic and it's one of the easiest ones to trigger Basically, eulogy will trigger if any uh, unit, yours or your opponent's, has died earlier on in the turn. Um, which you can trigger very easily with, for example, your hero power or just by trading into one of the opponent's units first. Um, Necroblast allows you to deal 3 damage to an enemy unit and if any enemy enemy unit or one of your units has died prior to that, then it will also deal one damage to adjacent units, uh, units adjacent to that enemy unit. So just a very strong card in general. Uh, only two gold as well. Definitely you want to include this in your deck. Cemetery Bannerman is a very strong card to include, even though it's only a 1-2. When it dies, it summons three more 1-1s, one -ones, which is very strong in Grave Digger. So this is something you want to include. Um, Spikecaster is a very helpful 4 cost unit um, that whenever another friendly creature that cuts two or more dies you summon another 1-1 one -one, which as Gravedigger you want to generally swarm the board with um, creatures as much as possible so this helps a lot with that. Uh, Stench of Death is your AoE removal, it deals 3 damage to everything, all units and all players on the board so be a little bit careful when you use this if you have a lot of units on the board yourself. Um, but generally it's very strong AoE removal and one of the cheapest AoE removal spells in the game as well. And then finally Ashes to Ashes, which just allows you to destroy any unit for 5 gold. Uh, you want to save this for your opponent's stronger units, of course. 
Like if they play a big rock troll, 9-8 or another high gold cost unit, then this is great for removing that. Um, so generally for Gravedigger, these are the five cards that I would recommend you to add to the neutral deck core if you're just starting out. Uh, these cards are both quite a lot more situational, not necessarily as powerful as well. This one is quite random in what it does as well. Um, summon an enemy unit that died this game may seem like fun on paper, but keep in mind that this can also include things like token creatures, like 1-1s one that may just have randomly spawned and died. Uh, basically any minion that has died uh, on your opponent's side of the field can be summoned back with this. So I generally don't think this is that great. Um, this also seems slightly overcosted for what it does, uh, except in combo decks where it can have use occasionally. But if you're a new player, you just want solid units um, that are gold efficient on the board so, and support that with some powerful spells, basically. So I would go with these five for Grave Digger, definitely. Uh, knight, let's see. Um, knights will be a little bit more aggressive. Um, if you use the neutral core that I recommend with Knight, then it's going to be a bit faster paced than most other, um, most other heroes discussed here. Um, again, some of these are level rewards. I don't remember exactly which ones. I know Wild Swing is a level reward. Um, but again, the level rewards, all the level rewards can be obtained by simply leveling the class to level 5, which doesn't take long at all. And after that you get the card, two copies of the card for free. So that shouldn't be too much of an issue. Uh, for Knight you definitely want to include Blacksmith. This is a very powerful 2-drop that allows you to buff any peasants you summon with your hero power. Uh, Hearty Breakfast, also super strong. Uh, give a friendly unit plus one strength and deflect. Deflect is basically divine shield in this game, so this allows you to trade super effectively um, and really establish board control very early on. Uh, wild Swing, basically execute one gold cost more, but very strong for removing um, higher health. Enemy units, just trade one of your peasants into them, dual dealing one damage to them, and then cast this to remove it. Um, the rest is mostly up for debate. Master of Bacon is a decent one cost card. You can play it on turn one, summon a peasant as well with your hero power, and then this will come into play as a 2 3, which is decent. Uh, write them down is a card that I'm normally not a huge fan of, but it is the only real area of effect removal spell that Knight has available to it, so I probably include that anyway if you're a new player. Uh, like I said, Knight may be a little bit trickier than. Uh, Shapeshifter, Gravedigger, or Prophet to begin with. Um, it's definitely a decent class, but it does require you to play a bit more aggressively than other classes might do and really dictate the tempo of the game. If you fall behind in tempo, then it's quite difficult to recover it with Knight. Um, that's also the case with Alchemist, which I will also briefly discuss. Alchemist is definitely not one of the strongest classes in the game at the moment, though it is one of the most fun and most interesting ones. Um, starting with Alchemist can be decent still, just make sure that you're aware that you really, really need to continuously dictate the tempo of the game as Alchemist and maintain board control at all times, because right now Alchemist has very few ways to recover the tempo once it loses it. It doesn't really have any decent AOE removal effects or many ways to recover the board control after losing it. Um, if you start out, if you do decide to play Alchemist because it's just a lot of fun to play, then the parts you want to include in your opening deck are definitely Unstable Brew. This is a very strong removal spell with 3 damage for 2 gold and add a vial to your hand, um, which vials are like one of the random 4 a uh, small buff card that you also get from your hero power um, that allow you to make a creature a little bit stronger. Uh, this is definitely a very strong card. Uh, you probably want Huckster as well. This is just a very solid um, card to play on the first turn uh, in that it's a 2-2 two, two for 3 but it also summons another 2-2 two, two for 3 and this 2-2 two, two summon even gets buffed more when you play potions on it so this is a very solid card. Uh, Jar of Ogre Slobber is definitely a good card if you're just starting out. Uh, just give any unit plus 3 plus, plus 
plus three, plus three. Um, very helpful to allow your units to trade better into other units later on. Um, then you probably want Uzify as well, which is great spot removal for um, more expensive creatures or stronger creatures that an opponent might have. Uh, it basically transforms any of their units into a 1-1 one, one Oozling. Also great for getting rid of units which have annoying last laugh effect, for instance. Uh, and then the last card is a little bit open to debate. You probably want Chain Reaction, even though I really don't like this as an AoE removal spell. Um, it's very bad when your opponent has like a few high health creatures on the board, because it will almost never remove what you want it to remove. Um, it is good if your opponent has a number of small creatures on the board, like those can generally be cleared fairly effectively with Chain Reaction. Um, I'm not a fan of this spell, but it is the only real AoE removal that Alchemist has available, so we may as well include it. Um, and if you're already dictating the tempo of the game, then this can help you keep it up. So I wouldn't rely on it to help you recover the tempo if you lose it. Um, Merchant, as I said, I definitely do not recommend playing if you're a new player. Um, and also just these basic cards show that already. It's very difficult for me to recommend five cards here to play um, in a new player deck because the cards are just generally more controlling oriented. You can see there aren't nearly as many minions. There's no effective spot removal here. Merchant's playstyle as a whole is just quite different from the other classes at the moment, and it's not very strong right now, so I just don't recommend playing this class if you're just starting out. Okay, so when you have your 30 card deck together, then go play a few games in training mode first to get a feel of it. Um, the guild master, the AI that you play against in the training mode, will play very aggressively most of the time. Um, so that will give you a good feel of how you can defend um, and also take control of the game later on and begin dictating the tempo yourself. Uh, just a really good practice tool for new players. Um, and then after that, after you do that a number of times and you have some ink saved up, um, you might want to start looking at maybe a few rare cards or a few common class cards to your deck. Uh, I'll just briefly go through a number of cards which you may want to look at, which are just very powerful in general and also don't require much um, ink to craft. So let's see, we'll just move to all cards right now. And I'll just browse and browse the neutral cards for a bit. Um, contrary to what you might expect from other games, most competitive decks in Fable Fortune right now actually do not need any Fabled cards. Fabled cards are the highest rarity of cards. They are incredibly difficult to get. Their um, drop rate from packs is quite rare and they require uh, 2000 ink for neutrals or 4000 ink for class specific Fabled cards to get. Um, fabled cards are marked by the... Uh, let's see, why am I still only seeing basic cards? Um, no, we want all. There we go. Alright, so now we can look at all cards. Like, table cards are marked by the uh, red icon in the bottom. This is the, indicates that it's the highest fabled rarity. Um, but really, the only fabled card which you would want to include in any competitive deck right now is Chesty. And that's not even because it's particularly um, overpowered, but just because this card is really versatile in general. Um, but any other fabled cards tend to be very expensive. I'll just show you a few of them. Uh, let's see, for example, where can we find some more fabled cards? Like this, for example, 6 gold, and its effect is not really even that strong. Uh, here, again, these, these, these are fabled cards. Uh, they tend to have big, flashy, really cool effects. But they are really not necessarily all that strong. Uh, I would really only recommend playing most of these, or some of these, in more dedicated control decks. Most mid-range or aggressive decks don't actually benefit from having these at all. Um, 
It's not like Hearthstone, for instance, where you probably want something like Blood Mage Thalnos in most of the decks that you uh, end up making. Um, Fable Fortune, at least right now, doesn't really have fabled cards like that that you just want to include in any deck, no matter what. So that's why um, what I said earlier holds true, that it's perfectly possible to make a competitive deck at any level using only commons and basic cards, maybe supplemented with a few rares or epics down the line. Um, some rare cards that you want to look out for, especially neutral rares, which are the ones that I would recommend crafting first. So you can experiment with them in any class. Um, if you want to go for a Bandit deck, which is very strong right now, then Bandit Ambusher is definitely a must. This is basically a 3-2 for 2 that also deals 2 damage to any other unit if you control a Bandit, which is just really, really strong. Um, Bank Clark is another card which you can basically play in any deck. Uh, it has Morality, which means that its effect, again, only triggers after you've completed a quest. Um, both forms of Bank Clark allow you to draw a card when it comes into play, both the good and the evil forms, and then they buff the card that you draw in addition. And this is also just a 2-2 two, two for 2, which is solid enough on its own, just a really, really good card which is playable in any deck. So this is definitely one of the first cards that you should look to crafting, probably, once you have enough ink. Uh, rares require 100 ink to craft, so a little bit more than commons, but still definitely not much. Uh, let's see what else we might want to look at. Uh, again, for Bandit decks, another common Bandit Veteran. Bandit Veteran, really solid card. Um, Red Cap Chieftain is a really good card in aggressive decks. This is also a rare. Uh, it's a 4 4 for 4, which is solid enough, and it removes guard from all enemy units, which allows you to just attack the enemy directly. Um, very powerful for aggressive decks where you just want to overwhelm the opponent as quickly as possible. Uh, Wasp Queen, very helpful in controlling decks. I use this a lot in Profit especially, where you can uh, heal the Wasp Queen back up. Uh, anytime this unit survives damage, summon a 1-1 one, one Wasp, which is great for um, improving your own board control as well as just use defensively. Uh, hired Assassin, Pysoner, we already talked about. Bandit Ringleader, again, a really, this is a staple of any Bandit based deck, generally. Um, let's see if there's anything else we need to discuss. Caravan Leader is solid, but I wouldn't say it's the main priority for new players. And that's about it, I think, for cards that you really want to look to include as soon as possible. Of course, many of the other cards that I'm just scrolling past now are also very useful, and you may get uh, many of them from opening packs and put them in your decks just to try them out. Uh, I strongly recommend anyone to also just experiment on their own with different deck archetypes, um, different cards that maybe you just like the look of or that you think might be strong. Um, I definitely don't know everything about competitive deck building. Um, this was just meant as a guide to help new players to um, begin uh, PvP with just a really solid deck core and allow them to expand uh, upon that later on um, with their own experience. So hopefully this was helpful and I hope to see some of you in PvP. Uh, thank you for watching.